Good news, everyone. I've read your comments, and you know what? I agree. I hate when politics weasel their way into my Dungeons & Dragons. Everyday wokesters of the copes is forcing us to include pesky p-words into our game. And Matthew Murr Shill has the gall to make his own personal game positively popping with politics. But what if I told you your own game might have political themes that you didn't even realize were there? Worry not, good adventurer, because I'm going to help you purge those politics. But not like the Purge movies. Those are pretty political. I know what you're thinking. Tulak, you look really good today. And also, I would never put politics in my game. First, thank you. And second, you may have accidentally put politics in your game without realizing it. To simplify things, I've broken down political motivation into seven different basic sections because that's a magic number. These can overlap and won't cover everything, but we'll do a pretty good job of helping us keep things concise later while identifying various political problems in your game. Number one, militarism. That would be a state building an army, weapons, walls, moats, anything to protect themselves from an outside force or impose their will on smaller states. Obviously, any sort of soldier working for a government or a mercenary working under a contract will be serving a political purpose, so let's keep an eye out for that one. Number two, civil service. This is any sort of work someone does for the government that doesn't involve violence. Everything from democratically elected representatives to a public sector mail courier is covered here. How to play Newman in D&D when? Never. Newman's too political. Number three, natural resources, also known as hippie crap. Plants, animals, abominable hybrids of plants and animals. Burning down a forest and training a bear to prevent forest fires both fall into this category. Pretty broad spectrum. Number four, education. Everyone knows colleges are breeding grounds for leftist ideals. Remember, critically thinking will make you care about poor people more than those bad guys 2,000 miles away the TV man told you about. And why would the TV man lie to you? Because appealing to xenophobia is a great way to sell catheters and shitty pillows? Uh-oh. Sounds like I'm thinking critically. Let's move on. Number five, religion. Like education, but the sources are dude. Trust me. Separation of church and state is like everything in Dungeons and Dragons. Made up, but it's fun to pretend it's real. Number six is the real god of the state, economic systems. America, where I live, for example, uses capitalism, meaning that if you want money, you need to provide a good or service. Like my Patreon, where you'll get schedule updates, get to vote in polls, access to exclusive videos, and character sheets from all the characters for building character. You could even commission a specific character with the rates listed on the main page. Commissions are open right now. Anyway, the only one we can ignore is identity politics. That's pretty self-explanatory. It's the politics of an individual's identity. Things like gender, race, sexual orientation, that kind of thing. Since your D&D party has to be made up of individuals, there's no avoiding this one. But I know people won't be bothered by it, so we can just move on. Unfortunately, history is full of unintended politics. Upton Sinclair's The Jungle was a piece of fiction intended to show the horrible lives of the working poor in the meat industry. But instead of being concerned with working conditions, readers were mostly concerned there may be immigrant blood in their meat, leading to the Meat Inspection Act of 1906, which was good, but not the good thing that was trying to be done. That means the inherent message of your story could shift based on its audience's own politics. If you're not concerned with poor immigrants losing fingers in hamburger meat, you'll probably be more concerned when you have eaten an immigrant's finger, which you won't do. Obviously. Obviously, you're only looking to eat American fingers. In the realm of fantasy and sci-fi, Alan Moore's Watchmen was meant to be a critique of hyper-violent superhero stories, nuclear acceleration, and fascistic vigilantes. More like, Alan, more politics, please. But in Zack Attack Snyder's superior film adaptation, hyper-violence is rad. Dr. Manhattan is a badass. Nobody points out that Rorschach smells like shit. It's a repeated point in the book, Rorschach smells like shit, and everyone tells him. Also, he mails his journal to white nationalists. But while Zack's film effectively uses the graphic novel as storyboards, the leftist politics are replaced with something much closer to libertarianism. Zack would later alert moviegoers to his super cool politics by changing his production company's name to Stone Quarry. That or he's just a fan of Ayn Rand, political fiction author, without agreeing with her politics. To be fair, he clearly didn't understand Watchmen. Relating this back to D&D, imagine Watchmen as a source book written with political intent. When it's adapted by a DM, they're telling their version of the story, and the storyteller's perspective impacts the politics of the story. So Zack picked up a pretty anti-vampire Curse of Strahd and was like, yeah, but the vampire fucking badass and slow-mo and stuff. Or you could be poor Upton Sinclair trying to run a game for your players that makes them want to seize the means of production and instead they all learn prestidigitation and clean the meats of production. <laughs> That's why I need to help you. We need to craft a campaign that will be completely immune to both author bias and critical lens. Wait, campaign is a political word. A group of strangers killing things story. 
much better. Since Dungeons & Dragons at its core is obviously apolitical, let's start with the most basic premise we can. A dungeon in a dragon. Other way around. A small village is under the clawed thumb of an evil red dragon. He's forcing the villagers to give their gold, their sheep, and even their Funko Pops. But the village is out of gold and can't make any more money without selling sheep. King Bofa won't be bothered to ask his soldiers to liberate a village of this size. The only solution is to send a group of heroes into the dragon's horde, slay them, collect the treasure to rebuild the town. Wow. That was easy. Totally a political story. Other than the powerful figure destroying the community, hoarding the wealth that could fix the community, the community being ignored by the federal state, and the community assembling vigilantes to solve the problem themselves. Shoot. You could even look at this apparently highly political plot hook through two separate political lenses. The dragon could be a metaphor for over-leveraged taxes. The government seizes personal property like the sheep, and the king is an incompetent statesman, proving that big government won't help you. Or the dragon is the wealthy class, systemically destroying communities it takes from exploiting the labor of the farmers, and the king is so concerned with his military serving his interests, but not the people's. And the Funko Pops. Totally forgot the Funko Pops. Perhaps the biggest hurdle this brings to light is the issue of player motivation. Your adventurers will fall into two broad categories, those working for crown and country, and those working for their own desires. The heroes are agents of some sort of military or police force, then the story is encompassed in a narrative of violence in service of the government. War is political, thus soldiers are political. On the other hand, if your players are taking it on themselves to quest, the absence of government creates political questions. Why isn't the government force helping this quest? If your players are impacting the world, how far can they ethically go? If you operate outside the law, does society condone your actions? So let's take out the king. Now you're in a land with elected officials. Wait, no, that's politics, like directly. Maybe instead of royalty or democratic representation, the world isn't ruled by anyone. Instead, it's a set of communities supporting each other with subsistence farming, trading any excess goods with each other so everyone has their needs met. That's anarcho-communism. Okay, it's a prehistory campaign. Society has not formed. Your adventurers are a member of hunter-gatherer social structures, maybe only slightly bigger than a family unit. That way, there isn't any government or defined absence of government that would make anyone think about the politics of living in a society. They'd have to be a real joker to think your adventure takes place in a society. We now have a group of roaming adventurers that are all in the same family. They have to be related, otherwise we'd have to talk about races. <laughs> Look, any party of adventurers made up of people from other cultures is going to lead to elements of multiculturalism. A dwarf and an elf having different customs and ways of living, working together in the same party, is preaching about accepting people from different backgrounds. We know that's political. Even humans from other places and families could have different values. Look at the real world. Since I know realism is so important to everyone who hates politics in their games, you don't have the same beliefs as everyone you've ever met. Experiences can vary so much from person to person, with those perspectives clashing to create heated debates. Families aren't totally immune to this. Make sure to tell your players that they were all raised in a cave together with no outside ideas or opinions falling on their not pointy ears. After that, they should roleplay their characters the way you want them to. That's what D&D is all about, right? Your players doing exactly what you want them to. Since they're all coming from the same place with the same background, they should also have the same skills. So sorcerers are right up. That would imply a magical heritage, which wouldn't make sense this early in the world. Wizards and artificer are obviously a no-go. A character can't study magic before writing is invented. No clerics, monks, or paladins spirituality is religion, that's politics. Druids and rangers are too connected to the environment, so no deal on a green new deal. Warlocks sign up with a magical entity, which wouldn't be human, so we're back to multiculturalism. Barbarians were defined by the Greek as anyone who isn't Greek, so that's an immigration policy in your game. Bards are artists. Art school is where you go to get corrupted by leftist ideals, so that's not allowed. That'll leave us with rogues and fighters, but since the concept of expertise implies someone in the family unit has focused on a talent outside the norm, I think we need to stick with fighter. Thankfully, there's plenty of fighter archetypes you can use, just not samurai because elegant courtier would make you a courtier. Cavaliers are discount rangers that are better rangers than rangers, but that means that they're connected to nature and generally connected to knighthood. Knights are agents of a state, cavalier is out. Battlemasters are student of war, that means school and war, both political, both illegal. Rune knights are giants, which would be another sentient race. Multiculturalism, be gone. Echo knight, arcane archer, eldritch knight, and cyanite are all magical, so that's restricted. Thankfully, champion is here to keep things apolitical, giving you plenty of options if you want to hit stuff or stab stuff or shoot arrows. Your players can do all three of those things. But who 
will your players be hitting, stabbing, or shooting? D&D is all about committing acts of pretend violence, and committing to anything, even violence, can inspire people to get political. There are literally hundreds of different monsters in 5e, so instead of breaking them down individually, we'll put them into large groups and assume that each individual in that group will behave as part of a unit. Nothing political about that. First, let's get rid of anything with sentience. Remember, multiculturalism is a slippery slope, so we can't have anything that can think or make decisions beyond basic survival. Otherwise, you could end up with a villain compelling enough to create a decision for your players, which means the family unit we forced our players to be part of could split. So, that's aberrations, dragons, elementals, fey, giants, and humanoids. Right out. I didn't mention celestials, fiends, and undead because those are also tied to religion, with angels, devils, and the concept of an afterlife putting some serious theocratic strain on your game. Theocracy, of course, being a government run by a religion, not ran by a guy named Theo. Of course, there could be an angel named Theo who forms a theocracy to fight a group of organized demons who form a demo -cracy. That actually sounds like a fun one-shot, a tyrannical angel who could try to make the world worse than the friendly demons who want to burn the world down. Players have to choose which side they want. No, no, sorry. Almost let them get to me with the politics. Constructs are artificial life built by science or magic, which means some sort of educational system has to exist. We've seen those dancing robots from MIT. They're clearly going to lead the robots to unionizing and wanting rights, or just replacing human labor and creating massive amounts of unemployment to impact your economic systems, or lack of economic systems. Monstrosities are a mixed bag. Some are abominations of science, which would fall into educational issues. Some are just like animals. Rocks and owl bears are just big weird animals, but they're just animals. Since they're apex predators though, there's generally only one or two in an area. Killing them would upset the environment, so we have to kick those out. Honestly, hunting beasts beyond what you need for survival would also impact the environment. Same with sentient plants like the mushroom monsters or shambling mounds, which leaves us with the only one type of monster in 5e that is completely apolitical, oozes. Oozes are just jelly that don't think. They kind of just exist and eat stuff. Truly compelling villains, and definitely not just glorified traps. They're such weird creatures. Where do they even come from? One second, I'll look it up. Jubilex, Lord of the Oozes. Lord? That means this jello is either religious or has a government organization. Okay, so it looks like every type of enemy is going to be political. That's going to be difficult to get around, but you can still roleplay. It's called a roleplaying game after all. Your players can compete with each other, arm wrestling, and well, that's kind of it. So you probably won't have a big grand narrative, but you can invite your friends over to roll dice on a table next to each other and feel small amounts of satisfaction when their number is higher. Now that's what I call Dungeons and Dragons. Or I guess since there can't be dungeons or dragons, that's what I call rolling dice on a table. In summation, this game sucks, but it's also not what people mean when they say they want politics out of Dungeons and Dragons. This is what's called a straw man fallacy. When you don't want to debate someone's point of view, you create a fake version of them with the most extreme views to make yourself look better. Nobody actually wants to remove fiends from D&Ds because of religious implications, or wizards to get the boot because that means a magical school exists somewhere. I've engaged in a straw man fallacy and argued in bad faith. Kind of like everyone who says they want a politics-free D&D game. When someone wants no more politics, they're actually okay with militarism, big cool armies full of soldiers with big swords. They're fine kicking evil giants that would invade a peaceful, good human community out of the world. And you can be dang sure they're fine calling an orc a dirty, slobbering savage. All of that stuff is political. It's just right-wing politics, which means politics interested in maintaining the status quo. So, why not just say that? Because apolitical people aren't going to change the status quo, and that is the end goal of conservative politics. Throwing your hands in the air and refusing to decide is still a decision. You can't be an apolitical person because abstaining from politics is a political choice. Which brings us to gatekeeping. As Dungeons & Dragons becomes more popular, it brings more people with more backgrounds and more ideas of what a game of D&D can be. Change is radical, the opposite of conservative, so if people liked the game the way it was, they'll push to either reverse the changes that have happened or stop people from wanting to make changes in the first First place. A great way to do that is to just keep them out of the space. Dungeons & Dragons is still fairly niche. Shout out to all my mom's friends she told to subscribe. I'm sure this video makes a ton of sense to you. But it used to be more niche. If D&D was a disease, it spread from the Midwest, which is famous for its diversity. There are Scandinavians, Norwegians, white people, Caucasians, and even white people. It's really white here, y'all, and I'm not talking about snow. It also appealed to fans of fantasy novels like Lord of the Rings. There were so many great characters in those books, like Aragorn and the three named women, two of whom were trying to date Aragorn. So 
now you've got white dudes, and the 80s weren't the best time to come out as LGBTQIA, so it's probably cishet or pretending to be cishet. That's not to say there were no people of color, women, or queer people, but not as many who would join later. As it turns out, games about bringing together groups of people from different backgrounds to solve problems bring together groups of people from different backgrounds. But with different backgrounds comes different ideas, which could seem scary if you liked D&D for Midwestern white dudes. Derry and Des Moines, Iowa? Bad joke. Anyway, that fear leads to gatekeeping, holding your hobby tight to your chest and pooping on your own buffet so no one else wants to eat there. It's a serious problem in the tabletop space, and even extends out into the real world. Professional political hucksters can make big money and push a bigoted agenda by rallying against woke SJW takeovers. Pushing people further to the right means they'll come back and eat more of your garbage, hate everything, made by people who aren't you, you can monopolize their attention span in an endless cycle of stinkiness. That's not to say that money can't be made fighting stinkiness. You advocate for a stink-free zone and let people know that playing at your table and in your space they won't be subjected to stinkitude, that can be a little slice of alright, instead of a little slice of alt-right. Which brings us to the thing that's even worse than bigotry. Virtue signaling. If you don't know what virtual signaling is, congratulations. Here's the quick skippy. A corporation or a person will say something that's morally popular to gain approval, following, and make money. Gillette makes a commercial saying you don't have to whistle at women on the street like a cartoon wolf. Star Wars puts two women kissing in the background of one shot that's out of focus at the end of the movie. Or a D&D YouTube man says endless war is bad. All of these are just as bad as bigotry, I guess. That's false equivalency, another logical fallacy. We've got a lot of them today. It's also another straw man. Picture this, you find yourself backed into a logical corner. You're unable to defend your point of view because society generally considers that point of view morally repugnant. If you were to engage in genuine debate defending your views, your audience would think you're a cretin. So, what can you do? Just say that the person you're debating is only being right because it's popular. Now the debate isn't on whether or not gay people deserve a seat at the D&D table, you're debating whether or not your opponent is just trying to earn points with the gay community for gay points. After all, if you win enough gay points, you get to go to gay Chuck E. Cheese, which is like a regular Chuck E. Cheese, but for grown-ups, and with gluten-free pizza. The only problem with the argument is that it can be shut down pretty simply. If someone accuses you of virtue signaling, just agree. That's the thing, y'all. Every time one of my videos gets political, I am absolutely just saying stuff to make you like me. Saying stuff to make people like me is literally my job. That doesn't mean I don't believe what I'm saying. If I wanted to make videos about how Going Woke killed the new Clifford the Big Red Dog movie, that'd be really easy. Just point out anyone in the trailer who isn't a white dude, accuse the studio of virtual signaling, and roll in that dough. I don't make that content because I'd hate it, and I'd hate myself. I virtue signal because, yeah, I want people to like me. I want an audience that shares my virtues, and I also want that audience to understand that I share their virtues. If someone gets to join my table at a convention, I want them to feel comfortable, knowing that I'm not going to traumatize them to prove how big and manly I am. When you form a group of people to play in my Discord, I want you to assume they're generally going to share your values. Also, link to the Discord on my Patreon page. Please go give me money. Look how good and virtuous I am. Oh, also the going woke killed Clifford people are also virtue signaling. That's literally all they do. That's their entire job. At least every once in a while, I get distracted and talk about variant human bards. <laughs> Other than making players from various backgrounds feel safe, being aware of the politics in your D&D game also makes the stories better. Stories generally have these things called morals, dating back to the oldest stories. This hack Aesop was always forcing SJW shillery into his stories. Since they were also all about animals, I'm just gonna go out on a limb, say he was a furry too. Stories without ideology generally feel a little hollow. Don't get me wrong, it can be fun to watch a bunch of stuff explode for about 15 minutes. But even your diehards or your John's Wicks still have values. John McClane loves his family and hates Eastern Europeans. John Wick loves dogs and hates also Eastern Europeans. Rocky loves Adrian and oh look at that Eastern Europeans again. It's almost as though the US military has a propaganda wing funding movies to make audiences xenophobic and also pro shooting guns. Those are things that you can think about for your game. Fighting anonymously evil dog murderers and Jean-Claude's Van Damme loses its luster pretty quickly. Creating a complicated dilemma where a player's choices affect the world in a major way also reveals things about the character and the player that they might not have known about themselves. It's rad, and it's all political. 
So basically, this video is me saying, I'm not gonna stop being political. It's not gonna happen. I don't think D&D can be divorced from politics. More importantly, I'm not an apolitical person. These videos are mine and I'm going to make them the way I want to. If you don't like that, don't watch them. It's really that easy. You could even start your own apolitical building character show. I just think you're gonna struggle to find characters without political identity. Funky Kong, maybe, I guess. No, we're back to anarcho-communism again. Hey, maybe that means something. We could give it a shot. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, subscribe for more. We're making more weird videos like this every Thursday now. Join my Patreon if you want to support the channel directly. Follow me on Twitch if you want to watch me stream and hang out and talk about politics and stuff.